All right, the scripture we launched the year with was Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. And my thing is that there are too many Christians who have heard of, but haven't experienced for themselves, the now presence of God. There are too many who do not know the presence of God now. They flirt with the Lord, but they're not serious about Him. There are those, on the other hand, who are saying, Lord, we want more of you. We want more of your touch. We want more of your power. We're desperate for you. And I'll get onto it later on, but the more we ask, the more we knock, the more we seek, the more He's pleased to deliver Himself to us, but He also does not reveal Himself to the casual seeker. So we need to be people that know that if we want to learn to walk with the Lord, there's always a process required. He doesn't reveal himself to the lazy and the incompetent. He reveals himself to the weak, the lonely, the oppressed who reach out for him. There are Christians, I hope not in this room, but there are Christians who have settled at a certain place. And they're saying, that's it. God must come through for me, but I'm not going to change. You've got to change. There's no option. The Bible calls it sanctification, the process whereby we're changed to become more like Christ. And in this process, we need to learn how to hear the word of the Lord. Didn't Jesus say to his disciples, my sheep hear my voice? It is the privilege of a Christian. I could not have an epiphany, a revelatory moment where I'm so disappointed in God that I suddenly no longer believe exists. I can't do that. Because for 28 years, I've heard his voice. For 28 years, he's talked with me. I know. Someone said the other day, Greg, I don't want to just be strong on this, but, and I know I shouldn't say this, but just hang on. I said, bro, I've been hanging on for 29 years. I don't know any other way. I'm not going to stop now. I'm not suddenly going to change. When you've built a certain relationship with the Lord, it doesn't change. And when you've once heard the word of the Lord, and you know how real it is, and he speaks into your spirit, you stand strong and secure, according to Psalm 1. You stand as one who knows the word of God, who knows the scriptures. Although you can get buffeted, you aren't going anywhere. But so many flop around. Do you know what I'm saying? People often ask, when I listen to God, how do I know it's God speaking and not some other voice? I think that's an outstanding question. Or, I've asked the Lord to give me direction, but it's like I hear two voices. How do I know it's me or God? Another one says, how do I know I'm not just talking to myself? That's a good question. Because we do have people talking to themselves. Haven't you been to shops and you see someone literally having a coffee? I saw it the other day again. Literally sitting, and they're talking. And I looked, and there's nothing in the ears. There's no, there's no one, and I, look, I walked around, the and, I, and they're just talking. I saw this other guy walking, and he's having a full conversation. I doubt that's the Lord. These are legitimate questions that need to be answered. I mean, in Matthew 16, Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 16, verse 21, I must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things, be killed, and be raised on the, th on the third day. Peter, walking with him, says suddenly, Whoa, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Jesus turns to Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of man. Right there is an interplay between the voice of God and the voice of Satan. And I mean, Peter means well. He doesn't want Jesus to suffer. We always come with our best Christian comments when we don't want people to suffer. So this is not going to happen to you, Lord. That's not the word of the Lord. Jesus has to go to Peter and say, in this moment, Peter, this isn't even your voice. Peter loved Jesus. It's a desire to protect Jesus that he speaks from. But you've got to be careful, even when you speak in that circumstance, who you're representing. Is God still talking? Do you know that your relationship with God and your attitude to God can be free from distortion? Is God still talking? Psalm 81 is a sad account of God speaking to people who just won't listen. This compassionate father of ours is speaking and trying in numerous attempts to get their attention, but they're resisting him. Verse 8 of Psalm 81, Hear, O my people, while I admonish you. O Israel, if you would just listen to me, there shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth and I will fill it. In other words, I'll give you bread to eat. Like Jesus said, I have food to eat, you know nothing. But my people didn't listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So, 
I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe toward him. Their faith would last forever. But he would feed you with the finest of the wheat, with honey from the rock. I would satisfy you. God is pleading with the nation of Israel. He's saying, listen to me. Please hear my voice. Each of us maybe from time to time should be asking the question, Lord, have you been trying to tell me something that I desperately need to hear? Have you been exhorting me to listen? How many times do you think God may have spoken to you and I and we just weren't listening? How many times has he said something specific we needed to hear, but we were too occupied to pay attention? I think one of the most valuable lessons any Christian can learn, if you want to go big on God, is how to hear him. In the midst of our complex, hectic lives, I want to tell you there's nothing more urgent, nothing more necessary, nothing more rewarding than hearing what God has to say. And the Bible is loud and clear. God speaks just as powerfully today as he does then. He wants his voice to be heard. And when God's voice is heard by you, he launches you into whole new horizons you never thought possible. But you see, the word is the fuel of faith. Faith only comes when you hear his word. And whether you're going through a great time or not so great time, you need direction, whatever it is, you need the word of the Lord because it's the word of the Lord that sustains you. Why does God speak today? I mean, if he gave us everything we need to know from Genesis to Revelation, is it true that God still speaks today? Does he have to speak to us today? Well, here are some compelling reasons why God speaks to us. Number one, he speaks to us because he loves us just as much as he loved the people of the Old and New Testament. He loves you as an individual. He wants to fellowship with you as much as he fellowship with them. There is no fellowship if it's one-way dialogue. If we're doing all the talking according to all our requests, but we're not listening to him, that's not a relationship. There's no, there's no fellowship in that. There's no fellowship when one does all the talking and the other one does the listening. Remember Cat Stevens with that song of his father and son. From the moment I could speak, I was ordered to listen. God speaks today. He wants to develop a love relationship that involves a two-party conversation. So the first reason is because he loves us. Second one is because we need his definite and deliberate action in our lives. Look at Joshua, Moses, Jacob, Noah, etc., etc. As his children, we need God's counsel for effective decision making. Because God wants us to make right choices, he's responsible to give us the data by which we make those decisions. Isn't it? He doesn't leave us alone. When he wants us to make good decisions, he gives us what we need to know in order to make them. Third reason God still speaks to us is he knows we need comfort and assurance as much as the old believers did. Everyone in this room has or will go through Red Sea experiences when your back's to the wall, you don't know which way to turn. We undergo failure, we undergo defeat, we undergo things and God wants us to know that he's with us. He'll comfort us, your your staff and your rod, they comfort me. You will know the present word of the Lord in your life. Okay, so we understand God still talks. How did he talk in Bible days? There's a few ways God spoke. The first way God spoke in Bible days, he spoke by direct revelation. Can you imagine he spoke by his spirit into the spirit of Abraham? Genesis 12 verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Can you imagine being Abram waking up one day with a thought? You're old. When you're old, you're worried about your future. That's why church planters are young because they can afford to make the mistakes. When was the last time someone that side of 50 went to plant a church? Like, oh no, the risk factor is too high here. You know, I've got things to think about. Imagine being Abram. Wifey, Sarah. Yes. Not that all women answer like that. (laughs) Pack up. What? Pack up. Why are we going? Where? I don't know. Who said? A voice. Really? Yeah, I got a voice. Remember, his family was moon worshippers. I got a voice. Tom, we must pack up. Where are we going? I don't know. He'll tell us. But we've got to leave everything we do know. The direct word of the Lord. Abraham is today called the man of faith, the father father of faith, the friend of Jesus. He heard something that witnessed with him. And one of the beautiful ways you know it's God is it hardly ever suits you. 
There's enough people in this room. The Lord spoke. I had a freak come in this church and say to me, the Lord, I'm, I'm getting divorced. Really? Yes. What does the Lord say? No, the, his exact words to me. Exact words. No, the Lord's cool with it. Your Lord might be. Not the one of the Bible. God speaks by direct revelation. Number two, he speaks through dreams. Remember Daniel had the, the world's destiny was revealed to this guy in a dream. He saw what was to come. I mean, can you imagine? I don't want that. But he had a dream of how the whole world's going to end. Daniel. Can I just say quickly though, nowhere in scripture are we ever sought to seek the mind of God in dreams. God may speak to you through a dream, but don't ever say, Lord, speak to me through dreams. I promise you, nine out of ten of my dreams do not come from Jesus. Is that right? Almost every Saturday night of my life, I dream that I come to church and it's empty. If that's the case, I might as well just stay at home. Because I had a dream. And in my dream, the people didn't pitch, nor should I. Like that pastor, remember, he just had enough. He couldn't cope. Said to his wife, I'm not going to church. What are you going to do? I'm going out. Phone the elders. I can't preach today. Okay, we'll cover you. Rest well. Thank you. Went to play golf in another town. The angels were horrified. What's going on here? He's playing a great game. He's recovering his soul. He's doing well. Some poor elders preaching back in his church. The angels come and said, are you going to let him get away with this? God's just not a chance. 16th hole, par four, bang, hole in one. Throwing his clubs in the air, you selfies. The angel says, is this how you punish? God says, well, who's he going to tell? <laughs> you see, some of us need to understand that you may have dreams, but they're not always from God. So be careful how you discern those things. Number three, God spoke through written word. He gave Moses the Ten Commandments, the law, and used the law to communicate to his people. He spoke audibly in business in, in, in a, a biblical days. So he spoke, through, he, wrote, he spoke through his written word. He gave Moses commands by which the people should live. I actually underlined this in my Bible this morning. Uh, I was just reading in my own devotions, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 29, in my own devotions. God speaks to the nation through Moses. All of you are standing here today in the presence of the Lord your God, your leaders, the chief men, your elders, officials, all the men of Israel. Together with your children, your wives, the foreigners living in your camps, you chop your wood and carry the water. You are standing here in order to enter into a covenant with the Lord your God, a covenant the Lord is making with you this day and sealing with an oath to confirm you this day as his people, that he may be your God as he promised you, and as he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm making this covenant with its oath, not only with you who are standing here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God, but with all those who are not here today. The last verse of, of Deuteronomy 29 is verse 29. It says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. So God gives his word, to us. And he says, I will speak to you through my written word. The fourth way he speaks to us is, is, is audibly. Saul of Tarsus was on his way to persecute believers in Damascus in Acts chapter 9. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? They were audible voices. Some people, there are people maybe in this room who've heard the audible voice of the Lord. God speaks through prophets. The prophets used to say, thus saith the Lord, and they listened. And you listen to the word of a prophet because what a prophet said happened because they were under an injunction. If a prophet said something that didn't happen, you were to kill him. So in those days, they were careful when they speak. Today, we just sprout left, right, and center. This is the word of the Lord. In those days, they were a bit more careful than us because they knew they're going to die if they're not right. And, they, and, and the other way God spoke was through circumstances. Remember, God spoke through Gideon. Gideon said, Lord, you've called me to do something. I'm too scared. So he has a fleece. Make that wet the dry ground. The next day, make that dry, make the ground wet. He sp it, through our circumstances, do something, talk to me. God spoke that way. God spoke that through angels. He spoke to Mary and Joseph about the birth of Jesus through an angel. And then, of course, he spoke by the Holy Spirit. We know that story in Acts chapter 16 from verse 6. Paul's out to go and preach the gospel, and they went through the region of Phrygia, Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they'd come to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went to Troas, and a voice appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia to help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. God spoke just like that, by the Holy Spirit, through a vision, accessed him. 
Those are the way God spoke. But now God can still speak all those ways today. But can I just highlight the four primary ways God speaks to us today in descending order? Which means the first way is the most important way God talks to us. And that is, number one, through the word of God. Primarily, God speaks to us through his word. We have the complete revelation of God in this book. It does not mean that God has told us everything there is to know. It simply means he's told us everything we need to know. There's a lot that's not written in here. That's also true. But God has defined you and I as a people of the book. So we hold first and foremost to revelation that's in this book. If any other voice tells you something contrary to this word, don't go with that one. Go with this one. It is the anchor for a Christian. And I'm saying that because every sect and every cult that was birthed in Christianity and came outside of Christianity got revelation further than the word of God. And you could be sitting here today saying, I know what the Bible says, but I'm so puffed up with pride because I have the special revelation that God has shown me. If it does not correspond with this word, don't accept it. This is the word of God. It doesn't mean that the Bible has every answer, okay? The square root of 382 is not found here. Is that okay? But everything you and I need to know is in this book. The Bible is the revelation of God, the unfolding truth of God by God, but Himself. It is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit who controlled the hands and the minds of those who wrote this book. The Bible is literally the breath of God breathed upon men that we may know the truth. The most assured way we can know God is through the Word of God. When we face difficulties and heartache, rather than seeking this and that, go first to the Scriptures. God words, God's Word was first written in Scripture. It is always your go-to. Joshua 1 verse 7. Joshua is about to lead the nation into an area it's never been before. Under Moses, they were protected until all the rebels had died. God provided for them. They, never, they only had to fight one or two small battles. Now they were going to go into a nation where they were going to have to fend for themselves, fight for themselves, look after themselves. And so Joshua has to lead Israel into a forward-thinking momentum. And what's God's word to him? Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night, that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The Message Bible puts it like this. Give it everything you have. Heart and soul. Make sure you carry out the revelation that Moses commanded you. Every bit of it. Don't get off track either left or right. So as to make sure you get to where you're going. And don't for a minute let this book of the Revelation be out of mind. Ponder and meditate on it day and night, making sure you practice everything written in it. Then you'll get where you're going and you'll succeed. Haven't I commanded you? Strength, courage. Don't be timid. Don't get discouraged. God, your God is with you every step of the way. Folks, this is my long point, so stick with me on this. But God speaks to us through His Word. Just for a moment, early this morning, it was tough for me. Hence, you were sleeping. I'm worried about her. I'm just pray. I couldn't sleep. So I woke up through the night praying, asking God for her, praying for her. When I got up this morning, I had my devotion. Where did God take me to? Deuteronomy 28, 29. What does it say? If you hold to my teaching, it says, you will be the head and not the tail. You will only go up and you won't go down. And I looked at that word and I held to it this morning. And I said, Lord, this is your word over us. Because you speak that word. What is the result? Courage, strength, no timidity. You've got to remind yourself, that's what it says. That's what's written there. You don't go into the pity party of your soul. You go into the truth of God's word and you allow it to feed you. You allow it to minister to you. But how does that work for 21st century believers? I mean, what do you do? Well, when you pray and you seek guidance about a decision, ask God to speak to you through his word. Ask for some direction. What will usually happen? Well, as you meditate on the word with your decision in mind or request, whatever it is, God will often lead you to an incident in scripture, a passage, even a single verse. There may be a specific experience or a principle that governs something in that text 
that the Lord wants to bring to your attention. And so when he speaks, you, you take heed or you write it down somewhere and you think about it. And the next thing often that will happen is God will lead you to the same passage over and over and over again. Because he's trying to, to bring your attention to something. And when that happens, you need the time to listen and discern his voice. Even when God spoke to <clears throat> Jeremiah, he gave, in the beginning of Jeremiah, chapters 1 and 2, he gives him, or 6, wherever it was, he gives him two words. And in both cases, he says, Jeremiah, what do you see? He says, Lord, I see the following. The one is an almond tr a tree that's budded. The other one was a boiling pot to the north. He says, what have you seen? He says, this is what I've seen. He said, good. Now that you've seen it, let me explain to you what you've seen. Let me reveal to you what you've seen. Because sometimes what you've seen isn't the full answer. You need to take time for God to speak to you through that word. Don't jump off straight away. Like the guy was depressed and said, I'm just going to open anywhere, remember. And he opened up the Bible and it says, and so Judas hanged himself. And he said, well, that's not very helpful. He closed the Bible again. He said, that can't be God. Opened it again. And another verse says, now go and do likewise. Now that is not necessarily the Lord. Okay, telling you to go and enter. So when you hear a word, it's good to listen to it, go back to it, think about it. I know when we started this church, uh, I had no idea on what to do. And for our first three December, yeah, you can't wait to go on a holiday. And we used to go in, in, in February because it wasn't school holidays then. We didn't have kids. So we used to go on a holiday in February. And every February, I'm not preparing sermons. I'm not reading my Bible to preach to somebody. That's just for me. Because I've only been leading a church for two or three years. I'm a little punk. And I go and say, oh, Lord, where do I read my Bible today? And he takes me straight to Book of Acts. And I read chapter 1 to 28. 1 to 28. Three years in a row. Every holiday I went on, he took me back to the same passage. Where would New Day be today? If I hadn't allowed that to govern our thinking, would we have planted churches? Would we have released people? Would we have gone to the nations? Would we have done the things we've done at great cost to ourselves? Or would we be empire building like most? Where would we be if we hadn't gone back to the priority of what the scriptures say? Through his word, he'll direct, challenge, warn, comfort us. No Read the word of God till you know God has spoken to you. The home cell that I'm, that I'm with at the moment, I said to the guys the other day, I said, if, do, you, do you have a Bible program? I use Olive Tree. So I get an Olive Tree program and I buy a couple of commentaries and stuff. Then as I'm reading my Bible, every bit of info from archaeology to pictures to comments of other guys to, to uh, commentaries all comes up on its own in that column. And anything I'm reading, it just shoots up like this. And I'm able to read and discern the Word of God. It takes me forever to have a quiet time. Because after I've prayed and I go through, I start to meditate, search the Scriptures. Friends, be disciplined around the Word of God. And I don't like reading. Well, flipping start. I know, you know, you know, you know. Well, then go and you know the rest of your life. But I'm telling you now, it's a discipline. When I, I don't know how to read, then get an audio Bible. Don't tell me you don't know how to read and listen, because then you've got no hope. You're listening to me. Be disciplined around the Word of God. God says to Joshua, new territory, meditate day and night. Some of us are facing new territory right now, and it's the last thing we do. No wonder you're like a fart in the wind. Hear what I'm saying. The Word of God, number one. Number two, in descending order, it's the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is primary. He is God. But how do you know it's Him? Because Jesus said when He comes, He won't speak on His own. He will speak what He hears in heaven. And what's heard in heaven is consistent with the Bible. That's why I hit the Bible first. If you are well acquainted with Scripture, you won't be tossed to and fro with every new teaching. You will be familiar with the Word of God. Then the Spirit speaks. The primary way Jesus spoke in the New Testament was by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit dwells, lives, abides in us. If we walk in the Spirit, if we are surrendered to His power, we have the right to expect to hear from God through Him. You see, the Holy Spirit living within us and speaking to us ought to be the natural, normal lifestyle of believers. The Holy Spirit confirming the Word of God, speaking things into our hearts on an often basis. The Word of God and the Holy Spirit are God's primary ways of speaking and when i say the holy spirit speaks it's not always an audible voice in fact if you're hearing god audibly all the time go see a doctor will you because he does speak from occasion in an audible voice but the bible is clear there's an impression upon your spirit because the bible says deep speaks to deep he talks to you within it's from the place of your spirit not always your intellect from which god speaks because sometimes your intellect will block what the holy spirit is saying 
But you've got to receive in your spirit. And along with it comes peace, etc. He will impress his will into your spirit and your mind. Third way God speaks, I'm almost done, is through other people. Actually, the people, and I hate to say this, but the people we ought to listen to the most are the people closest to us. You know why? They know us best. They've got most access into our lives. They're the ones who love us the most, who pray for us the most. They're often the instruments God uses to reveal himself to us. Even your mother-in-law. God may use her. Miracles still happen. How many of you can name passing conversations where someone said something that literally changed the, the rest of your life? Because God uses people to speak. I remember going through a stage where the church wasn't really growing and people weren't getting saved. And I'm like, oh God, what do I do? I'm on a ministry trip to Tanzania. Hence, he is in, in uh, Joburg. We have one of our connect times. One of the guys comes to preach. And out of a whole preach of an hour, he threw out a two-minute thing that changed my life. When I listened to it, the other 58 minutes did nothing for me. But two minutes changed my life. And he did this. He said, I'm a preacher. I've moved to uh, America. Small church, not growing, not pro and the whole lot's not going wrong. So what did I do the one day? Friday night, Eric Clapton was in town. I got tickets to an Eric Clapton concert. He wowed me with that guitar work and that beautiful voice of his. Sunday morning comes church, I'm a bit disappointed. In Monday, the Lord spoke to me and said, Eric Clapton, all those people that go to Eric Clapton that were there Friday night, let me ask you, would they go every Friday night for about three or four years and give a tenth of their income to go there? Every month, not a chance. But the people in your church do for you. So instead of having an expectation that you should have more, be filled with gratitude that even one comes back. The attitude is gratitude, not expectation. Because expectation, you set yourself up for disappointment. Gratitude sets yourself up for thankfulness. It set me free. One comment. What have you had from people around you who issued a word that if you just held onto it would change the way you live? I was a 20-year-old, didn't even know I'd lead a church one day, and I went to a meeting where a foreign guy, I don't know if he was Asian, I don't know where he was from, Korea or Japan or somewhere, and he pre I went to a lunchtime meeting, I got off work for an hour, and he preached a message about reaching the nations for Jesus, the AD 2000 movement, and he said, we can reach all nations for Jesus, and I tell you, my heart burned in there, he did an altar call for like 200 people in a conference room, I couldn't even get from the back to the front, I stopped three quarters of the way down, got on my knees and said, Lord, I will dedicate whatever, I didn't know I'm going to lead a church, whatever you call me to, I'll dedicate to the nations. I'd never been to a nation. I didn't even have a passport. I said, but you said it, I'll do it. It changed the way I think. What are the little comments being thrown out to you that you choose to either hold on to or to regret? Then Deuteronomy 29, I read this word. Listen to this, verse 19. When such a person hears the words of this oath and they invoke a blessing on themselves thinking, I will be safe even when I persist in my own way. They will bring disaster on everything. The ESV says, those who say, I will be safe because I, I, I will continue to persist in my stubborn heart. God says he will take wet moisture and he will turn it dry in your life until you repent. We've got to be hearing the word of the Lord. By the word, through the spirit, through people. Lastly, and this is most suspect, but God speaks to us through circumstances. Circumstances take on many forms. Sometimes the loudest way God speaks to us is through a failure. Sometimes it's through a success. Sometimes it's through a tragedy. Sometimes it's through an incredible moment of deliverance. But he will speak to you through circumstances around you. You need to be careful not to draw too many conclusions from that one, though. Just learn the lessons. And the reason I say that is because God says in Revelation chapter 3, I open before you a door no one can close, and I close the door no one can open. I want to tell you there are times the devil can open doors too that God didn't want you to go through. Tower of Babel was built until God stopped it. You can with your own stubbornness and perseverance pursue something God never gave you and continue to give him credit until it kills you. Be careful with that one. But learn the lessons through circumstances doesn't always mean that you need to draw your conclusions yet. Those are the four ways God primarily speaks through us. When God speaks, we should all listen. David declared in Psalm 85 verse 8, I will hear what the Lord God will speak. Stand with me please.